Now, unfortunately, Simon Lee from Assembly Payments was unable to make the conference. He is based in Singapore and um, does send his apologies, but I know that Nathan's going to you know, say a few comments uh, on, on, on behalf of him. So we've got around 20 minutes for this panel discussion, and I've written some questions here for the panelists. But you know, I really invite you all to ask the, the, the questions to you're in the industry working uh, in, in NPP, and uh, really, please, if you have any questions, just, just put up your hand at any stage. So just to begin, can I just get all of you to, to introduce um, yourselves briefly and, um, and where you're from? Okay. Uh, Nathan Churchward from Cuscal. I look after uh, payment products and also represent uh, Cuscal at the industry level for NPP. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Philip Finnegan. Uh, I look after the Pacific business for ACI worldwide. Good afternoon. John Banfield, uh, CEO for BPay Group. Excellent. So, John, um, we'll start with you. We've, we've seen the launch of, of OSCO this month and a number of people have talked about it so far. How has the response been from, from the community? Well, I, I hope everyone has seen the ads uh, over the last couple of weeks and, and you're using OSCO. Uh, I'm one of those unfortunate customers that bank with a bank that haven't quite kicked off yet, uh, but I'm looking forward to it. But we, we are delighted with the response. Uh, you know, we started, as Adrian said, 13th of February. We saw you know, probably a maximum of maybe 100,000 transactions uh, going through any one particular day, largely Wednesday or Thursday. And we're now seeing up uh, nearly 400,000 transactions. So we're, we're delighted. Uh, with where we're at. Uh, we're delighted with the campaign that's up and running and we're now delighted also that we've got some form of critical mass whereby uh, we're able to start advertising out to uh, more than just financial institutions that know about OSCO. And, and what other features or innovations do you see becoming part <coughs> of the OSCO platform? Well, you would have seen from Adrian's presentation that uh, you know, OSCO and, and also the MPP have, uh, I think, a multitude of, of opportunities. Uh, we're working, the marks in the room, we're working on stage two right now, which is, which is request. Uh, we'll advance that uh, even further with a request uh, with a document attached. And, and we, we also see other applications, as Adrian does within the MPP, uh, things like tax invoices, things like B2B, uh, as other opportunities. And, I think for us, it's all about um, making sure that we're able to get to some form of, of scale quickly, and, and that means uh, being able to uh, not only think about uh, developing in-bank solutions, but we've got to think about alternatives, and uh, we're, we're open for thinking about what those alternatives may end up uh, generating. Thank you. And, and Nathan, what, what insights can you share um, about how financial institutions and their customers are responding to the power of NPP? So I know that uh, many of you in the room will have had uh, positive feedback from members and customers about the ability to now use their accounts. Uh, I think that uh, the fact that OSCO is invisible is like one of the pros and, and the cons that I do definitely um, hear people talk about Payments are now faster, so it's def an opportunity to make sure that your members and customers understand that's because you've invested in helping that. And uh, thank you, John, that you've highlighted one of those uh, value propositions in your bus shelters. Yes, and, uh, I've seen many of them, yeah. <laughs> but that is a very important thing, that we do need to think about what, what value we are bringing to, to our customers and how do they recognise that. But, where, where we're seeing it now looking is in, in businesses and services, not just the payments. And, and that's uh, a focus that cuscal has got and uh, you heard Adrian talk about us moving into non-banking non uh, institutions. So Assembly Payments is the first non-bank identified institution and they're providing uh, MPP payments to their, their merchant customers and their, uh, their platforms that they provide payments to. We've also activated APIs that we're rolling out to customers, and one of those is cash converters. So now if you get a personal loan through cash converters, you can have the money in your account within a minute, uh, thanks to uh, MPP and OSCO payments. So we're definitely seeing as more businesses become integrated, there will be many more opportunities to leverage the power of MPP. Excellent. And, and Philip, I'm sure the audience is keen to get a, a global perspective on NPP. What, what can you tell us? 
Yeah, so um, when NPP was conceived and Adrian started work on it, we all looked to the UK as an example and celebrating 10 years now. I think uh, from a global perspective, there's lots of interest in how quickly we've got to the point we've got that John and Adrian have given us updates. I think sometimes we're impatient about the results, but when we talk to uh, particularly North America, which was the centre of payments innovation for so long, they're very interested in what we've achieved, what's coming with APIs, the use cases that follow, and how we've really split the system into a couple of usable areas between PayID, OSCO, mm -hmm. which is a fabulous solution, and there's immense interest mm -hmm. as people look at what's next. Uh, but it's really about what's next that they're, they're very interested in. Okay, and can you talk a bit about then what is next and what is driving uh, innovation in, in this space, <coughs> particularly in other markets? Yeah, it, it's really the future is, is, is fast, but it's, it's open. Mm -hmm. and, and really achieving those API capabilities, as Adrian's talked about, uh, we've heard from Nathan, is absolutely essential mm -hmm. in creating the innovation and really starting to put that control consumers are wanting mm -hmm. is putting it in their hands through banks, uh, financial institutions and merchants themselves. And, and based on what other countries have done with regards to MPP and rolling it out, you mentioned mm. U the UK, Europe, mm. US. Um, what, what can we learn in terms of what they've done really well yep. and, and to ensure that Australian institutions get this right? Yeah, I, I must start with uh, fraud uh, mm. and fraud protection. Uh, as transactions vol ramp volumes ramp up, I was looking at your slide uh, in the march to Cybos. We, we just make must make sure consumers are confident with the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, any breaches or fraud, once you have one of those, you don't use that, that means anymore. Uh, so we did see some delays out of the UK and European real-time systems as people read about fraud, but I think our sense, uh, and perhaps uh, the, the gents will agree with me, we have addressed that so mm -hmm. far, mm -hmm. but, but time will tell. Uh, the next part is really, as you innovate on the outside of your solutions, got to get the core right. A and Wayne was really talking about that. Mm -hmm. Systems need to be up and available, very much 24 by 7 now. So we've seen some interesting things in uh, UK, Europe, where people have stumbled. But on the innovation side, we're seeing large multinational entrants really being successful. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at uh, ING, have really re-entered the English market uh, recently with their uh, YOLT example, uh, and that's really been because of the innovation that's available. And I think as we think in this room, what comes next, it's your go-to-market strategies can be very different to the past. Mm -hmm. may not be your primary brand, it could be a secondary brand. Okay. And Adrian, you, you spoke just earlier on about uh, the, the rollout of NPP. For those uh, banks offering NPP to their customers, what can they do to promote it? Um, so I really think it depends on what you're selling and, and who you're selling it to. So for many of the organisations in the room, your focus is going to be on your retail customers. Um, you, you know, you, you are in the best position of anybody. I mean, John can spend as much of his money as he likes taking out, um, you know, fabulous bus ads. But <laughs> ultimately, that, that's your channel that you can talk directly to your customer and you can do it. Um, you know, better and more effectively, more cost effectively than, than John can or I can. So I think for you, it's about, it's about owning that channel. It's about reminding uh, your customers of the investment that you've made uh, into delivering that service. Uh, and, and, you know, if you can't um, think of ways to do that, then I'm sure the, the marketing team at Cusco mm -hmm. or, or, or BPay have got some toolkits that will help you do that. Um, obviously focused, I think, on the mobile channel because that's where many of your customers increasingly will hang out. Um, the other observation I'd make, if you're, you're an organisation that also provides business cust um, um, services, then I think you need to time your investment in those channels to when you have that capability available. So, um, as I said, most banks, um, you know, with one or two exceptions, haven't yet gone live with their, with their business-focused portals. Uh, but if, if, if you have a business focus portal and you're, you're going to make that, that channel available for faster payments, then, then absolutely, again, you've got a great opportunity to do that. The one observation I would make is um, I think that many banks, um, and I, can, I know a number of you in the room uh, who've told me this, have, have kind of held back uh, on, on promoting this to your customers yet until reach has been fixed. Uh, and, and I absolutely get that. Um, you know, my message to you is, you know, 53 million accounts is a lot of accounts. 
You don't have to download any apps. Uh, you don't have to do anything special. It's available there in the banking channel that you use today. Uh, I understand if some of you, you know, your customers are a bit confused because what is this OSCO and what is Pay ID? And, and we have heard that people have held back uh, until that reach has been, has been finalised. And I guess my message to you is um, the job is nearly done. Uh, we've got about 10 days left to go. Uh, and then I think you should kind of uh, let rip. I, I, was, I was just going to add to, to Adrian's comments to say that, um, to, uh, to say congratulations to those that have actually picked up the marketing toolkits because I think of the 60 odd financial institutions that participate today, uh, there are nearly half that are actually have taken up the toolkit and actually using uh, the availability of, of what um, our marketing teams have put out there to financial institutions. And, and I can guarantee most of them are actually in this room. Um, so congratulations, well done for doing that. Awesome, great. Were there any questions from the floor? Yeah, thank you. Um, yep. Danny Pavasic from Unity Bank. Um, we've seen the industry make a very significant investment in OSCO and NPP. And then at the same time, we've seen some of the majors go off and uh, make an investment in BMIT. Um, just interested to see how that's, or your views on how that will play out. Yeah, I, look, I can answer that. Um, uh, so, uh, how do I be polite? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so, uh, I, I know for a fact that uh, BMIT um, is, uh, the transaction numbers on BMIT are about the same as the transaction numbers that we would do in about half a day. Um, so their monthly transactions would constitute about half a day's traffic for us. So you can make your own mind up how well they're doing. Uh, so look, I think um, I'm always open to competition and, and I think um, I, I'm not sure what CBA's thinking was around that, um, but I do strongly believe in the proposition that the MPP have built and um, that we've built as an overlay service on the top uh, Adrian just expressed before, in-app, um, you don't have to do anything. The app's there, you sign in exactly the same way. Using a pay ID, it's really, really simple. Um, an in-app solution means that if you want to pay someone, um, they have also got to be um, a, uh, a Beamit customer, as an example. So it's, it's not necessarily as easy uh, as the way in which I think the MPP and, and OSCO have, have been built today. So I think great for competition, um, great for um, elements of the marketplace out there, and I'll be really interested just to see how things progress over the next uh, you know, six to 12 months on both OSCO uh, and also on, on other product types. I think Can I give a slightly different answer? Yeah. Sure. So, okay. so I think the banks were always going to lead with a bank-led product. They were always going to start with a bank-led product, particularly in Australia, given their ownership of BPay and the strength of those brands that are worth billions. Um, but it, you know, it comes with challenges, right? Because you've 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 got to get all the ducks lined up in order to 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 make stuff happen, and so I think. BMIT is a bet that says if you take everything out of the bank's back offices mm -hmm. and you shove it about a kilometre behind us in Piermont, which is what they've done, and you don't let it touch the bank at all, then you can do stuff faster. Uh, and you can be like Uber, where on Spotify, where every Monday morning I look and I've got a new app download with new features. So I think it's not either or, I think it's both, mm -hmm. but, but stripping it away from the back office gives you and the bank gives you a much different challenge, which is how do you build reach? How do you, how do you get reach? And it turns out you have to pay people 10 bucks to sign up. Yeah. So that's yeah. the kind of, that's the challenge. It's, e it's, not, it's either or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and definitely in other markets, we've seen that there are standalone as well as bank oriented. But even in the US where those standalone solutions started earlier, uh, the bank oriented Zelle has caught up and overtaken. Yeah. I think there's room for both. Yeah. yeah. And just to add to Nathan's sure. point, in the US market, there's multiple offerings such as that. Uh, and you talk to a US consumer, you have the privilege of going there a couple of times a year, they're using multiple apps, but they're falling further and further down the virtual wallet, 
but so effectively from a usage perspective. But there is room. Mm. Great. So we have a question from a Pigeonhole Live. I'm glad that people are engaging with the platform. So it's from Sarah. When do you think we'll start? When do you think we'll start to see banks using NPP instead of RTGS for domestic SWIFT transactions? Okay. Is there a view that RTGS has less risk than NPP? That's Sarah Richardson from RACQ Bank. Okay. So as part of the compliance releases for, uh, for this year, one of the optional features will be the settlement of uh, international payments using NPP rather than uh, RTGS. That will take an upgrade to the, the messaging to carry uh, all of the, the identification and all those uh, elements that come with the MT140 to transfer over to the, the ISO message, but you will start to see it rolling out through 2019. Um, from Cuscal's perspective, we're currently scoping up what that work would take, and it will be an optional um, feature for our clients to use as an alternative to receiving your uh, inward payments uh, via your NPP channels, rather than our IPEX uh, gateway, which will give you very good uh, straight through processing, because rather than the manual step you have now, you'd receive it straight through. We do need to upgrade some of our uh, screening capabilities, though, because we want to be able to screen those transactions for you as well. Okay. Any other questions from the floor or the panel? No? Oh, uh, oh at the back. Sure. Paul from WAW Credit Union. Just interested in a comment that you made earlier, Nathan, about um, some merchant systems that you've been working on. I think that's a uh, natural progression for MPP to go down that path. Uh, it seems to be, sometimes it feels like it's a, a product gap that we don't offer very well within the mutual space. I feel though that, you know, the trajectory of that might be uh, closing, well, we're closing that gap, I suppose, over time. Have you got a view on how long the traditional um, merchant system um, sector has got before, you know, the MPP and, and real-time payment starts to, um, I don't know, release its gra grasp over the business sector? We've identified that payment service providers and those uh, platform providers are definitely the gateway to enable real-time payments into a, into a merchant ecosystem rather than dealing with the, those merchants direct. Fortunately, that's a great business model for, for Cuscal and we have those as uh, many of our clients uh, in our growth segments already. So <clears throat> the opportunity though is not just for those platforms and gateways to use the new APIs because they're more web-centric and uh, simpler to use, it does give banks opportunities to integrate NPP payments for, especially for making payments, into more of your customer facing channels. So rather than just banking systems, uh, web systems. And I know that uh, though many of you in the room have thought about what other systems you would integrate NPP into down the track, but the, uh, the barrier to entry was probably a little bit too high. We, 2019 is definitely the year to start thinking about when you take that out to your business customer channels, not just your personal banking mobile apps. And we'll continue to work with the payment service providers and, and platforms that we're starting to work with to ensure that we're targeting more of those systems that your business customers use, that they can then aggregate those with those services. Adrian, what are you seeing in the, uh, in the broader market though? Um, so I, I think I think requests is is a category killer. Um, uh, I think um, you know the the, the 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 card proposition, particularly for online. I mean, all I need to know really is the PAN and the CVV two, and I can take as much money out of your bank account before your fraud protection system will stop me. Um, uh, but but you know I think if you look in other I've, 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 overseas jurisdictions, um, um, you know, real-time payments really cuts through for online purchases. Um, so you're, 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 you're buying something uh, online from, from a, you know, an online vendor or an airline 
And rather than getting your card out and putting in your, 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 your PAN and your CVV, um, you push, you know, pay with, you know, pay with S, pay with OSCO, or, mm. and your, your, your mobile phone will vibrate in your, in your bag and it'll say, do you want to pay $274 to Qantas? And you hit yes and then the, the payment completes. And that's the kind of screen flow that we see in overseas jurisdictions. If you go to the Netherlands, um, uh, uh, where you know a couple of us visited um, earlier this year, 80% of online purchases are made from a bank account. Uh, whereas in Australia, 80% of online purchases are made using a, a scheme card. So I think there's lots of upside. Um, uh, requests is the key. Uh, and we need to work really hard, uh, which all of us are doing, to make requests a winner and to make it uh, uh, integrate as quickly as possible as we can into your channels that your customers use to do their banking, uh, because that's the kind of gap we need to close. Mm. That request to pay model is just so powerful, uh, creating new partnerships between banks and merchants. And we saw, what was it, NatWest? Yeah. Uh, announced something recently which is getting significant take up. I'm not sure there's that much online fraud's that easy, Adrian, but I'll, I'll talk to you later. Um, <laughs> Depends how good your fraud system is. Exactly, isn't? exactly. But um, you know, there is those, that, that dynamic is really coming to play and it's quite natural for people and, and takes them back to their, their bank's app or their financial institution, which I think is a powerful proposition for most of the people in this room. Mm. Yeah. In fact, the way that uh, I'm seeing that request play out. It'll be very much aligned to open banking principles, where it's um, a third party asking for you to authorise payment to be pushed from your account, as opposed to the pull mechanisms that we have now. So it brings in a lot more trust, but it also ties the data, because it's not an unsolicited payment that has anything. It is a payment that has the data that the receiver needs to automate the processes. Mm. And it puts your customer back in control, oh, yeah. which is what, where they like to be. Yeah. Our expectation is that that project, and uh, I think it'll be uh, going to the BPAY board for conf confirmation this month, or in the very shortly, John, to uh, kick off in November. And uh, Cuscal is committed to being there on day one so that you also can also be there on, on day one of request launching in 12 to 18 months. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any final questions from the audience? Yes. Having to agree um, and collaborate on payment development. How do we take more of the um, experiment loop that Charlotte spoke about this morning and put it into industry development and innovation? It is definitely a challenge. One of the opportunities that we always saw early on in creating effectively what we've done with the Cuscal payment engine is an overlay for enabling uh, other financial institutions to use MPP is that may give us an opportunity to do some of that experimentation because we have that, that community. Uh, but at this stage, we haven't yet been able to identify what that may be. Uh, we've had some ideas, but you're right, Kate, that uh, the, the hurdles to start experimenting in payments are, are very high. I think the stability of the core of NPP and, and as designed by your organisations does allow for more innovation on the outside of the digital channel. Yeah. And that, that will provide unique value adds that we haven't seen previously. So we're, when we look at what took place in Singapore with real-time payments and other markets, the innovation at that, the, the customer touch point has definitely increased as a result of real-time payment systems. Yeah, I, I think it's about capabilities, Kate. I think it's about we've got the reach. Now we need to um, put new capabilities into the system and make sure that we don't build single-use capabilities that only do one thing and then we have to kind of lift the hood and do them again. So from my perspective, and I know the team at BPAY and Cuscal are thinking, well, if we're going to spend you know, money and time and effort lifting the hood to build something, let's make sure that we can use it for a handful of different things. So we've got the building blocks there, request to pay, a consent engine, um, you know, a document um, host, we can 
block those together in a way that enables us to do slightly different things using the reach that we've that we've spent so 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 we've worked so hard to get Thank you very much, uh, panellists. Please uh, join me in a round of applause for Adrian Loveney, John Banfield, Nathan Churchwood and Philip Fennigan.